This afternoon, uh, it's really nice to gather for these uh, intellectual events. Um, uh, very much uh, appreciate seeing you all here, and um, I do find for graduate students that uh, important ideas come in surprising places. Uh, those of us in the field are sort of nodding along with this idea of having discovered uh, important research uh, projects, important research ideas. Uh, when we were going to a talk, we didn't think was necessarily going to deliver us exactly that. Um, it's also possible to go to a great talk and uh, have it deliver the things you wanted it to deliver too. But um, but I, I do think these kinds of gatherings are uh, really fertile territory for um, uh, the life of the mind. So uh, I'm glad to see everybody. Um, come in, come in. No, no. We should make some sort of chair space maybe is, in case other people want to slide in also. But so let me get started. It's a great pleasure to introduce my colleague and my friend, Katarina Gerstenberger. Um, Katarina is a professor of German uh, in Utah's Department of World Languages and Culture. Her books explore uh, the environment and contemporary German culture. Uh, we are here today because Katarina was our environmental humanities research professor a few years ago. Um, the environmental humanities research professor professorship is a competitive honor that gives a Utah faculty member release time to pursue an ambitious scholarly project. Uh, this year's EH research professor is uh, Rachel Mason Dentinger, who's sitting with us uh, right now. Um, so uh, we were glad to welcome Katarina as our research professor. Um, it turned into a bit of a slippery slope for Katarina because <laughs> it quickly morphed into her becoming um, the interim director of uh, environmental humanities. Um, and so uh, she has become stitched much more closely into the fabric of the, uh, of the program than, uh, than she perhaps knew when she got started. Um, don't let that scare you away, Rachel. Um, but that said, uh, a, fine do a fine job she did of it, and uh, I am most grateful for her labors on our behalf. Um, so today, Katarina will talk to us about her research into nuclear narratives. Uh, and so without further ado, I give you Katarina Gerstenberg. Thank you, thank you, Jeff, yep. and thank you all for coming. Privilege to be able to present my uh, research to you. So I'm currently working on a book on three nuclear sites, um, starting with Bikini Atoll, Chernobyl, and, and Fukushima. And I'm interested in the, how these sites are depicted in, in, in literature, in film, and in visual arts. So what I'm going to do today is, is present sort of a segment, a section of this research to you. Um, I've not presented this anywhere else before, so thank you very much for allowing me to try it out uh, in front of this audience. And I very much look forward to your comments, sort of to see what you think, what works, what doesn't work. It's, it's precisely these, it's precisely these presentations, these, these opportunities for exchange, actually my experience over the years that may work better and that help you move from the presentation stage to the initial book stage at some point. It takes a while. But so but I'm I'm currently on Tanner Leave, so I'm near the Tanner Humanities Center. So I've had have time to spend on this and um, have progressed I think a little bit over the last weeks and months. So thank you so much for being here. It's, it's an honor to be able to present. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about fallout and fear, the emergence of nuclear narratives in the wake of Bikini Atoll. Among the many dangers humans have created for themselves and for the planet, radioactive fallout and contamination is perhaps one of the most spectacular but also speculative threats. It is invisible to the eye and cannot be perceived by any of the other senses. Spread around the globe by above ground nuclear tests from 1946 into the 1990s, radioactive particles can be, de be detected virtually everywhere. The dramatic nature of a nuclear explosion and its often highly visible amp impact on the close vicinity, on one hand, 
as the very real, yet hard to gauge and notoriously controversial long-term effects on the environment make this topic so fascinating, so relevant, and so complex. The story of radiation as a global concern begins with the discovery of fallout. Fallout refers to particles made radioactive in a nuclear explosion that are sucked high into the atmosphere and then descend back to the ground, distributed by the wind and washed down by the rain. Its story is one of uncertainties, denials and fear, but of course also of careful scientific study. Anthropologist Joseph Masco, and he's one of the people who has written extensively on fallout, describes fallout as the aftermath, the reverberation, the negative side effect, the negative side effect. The existence of radioactive fallout after a nuclear event has been known since the very first one, which was the Trinity explosion on July 16th, 1945, at the Alamogordo bombing and gunnery range in New Mexico. But the story was slow to get out. Fallout was downplayed after the deployment of nuclear bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki on August 6 and 9, 1945, respectively. It became an issue of concern and consternation during Operation Crossroads, the first round of tests conducted by the United States on Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands in the summer of 1946, when scientists found it difficult to convince Navy commanders that the ships anchored in the Bikini Lagoon for testing purposes were highly contaminated, even after having scrubbed down with lye. Fallout entered into the international public perception after the Casa Bravo shot, the first deliverable hydrogen bomb detonated on Bikini Atoll on March 1st, 1954. This is where my story sets in. So um, just to remind us, um, the Marshall Islands are in the uh, Pacific Ocean. You can see here we have well, China, Australia, Japan up here, the United States, Hawaii, and the Marshall Islands. It's, it's still a little bit north of the equator, so it's the northern uh, Pacific. So that's where these islands are, kind of in the middle of nowhere, because that was a topic of debate. What does that mean, middle of nowhere, uh, where the Americans who um, uh, occupied the Marshall Islands, if you will, after World War II, then they occupied before by the Japanese, before that by the Germans, actually, which I only learned over the course of my research. In any case, so this is one of the reasons why they figured, okay, this is a good place to test some nuclear bombs here. So here we have now sort of a close-up. These are the Marshall Islands you can see in the North Pacific Ocean, consisting of, I think, about 35 islands and atolls and Bikini and Eniwetok, that's another test site here, sort of a little bit at the northwestern edge of the Marshall Islands. But that's sort of the scene where my story um, begins. And here, narrowing, uh, zeroing in even uh, closer, this is Bikini Atoll. So this is the site in the Marshall Islands in the Northern Pacific, uh, where these tests, or some of these tests, were uh, conducted. My little arrow shows you a huge bomb crater that was um, created when uh, they, uh, in 1954, detonated the Carson Bravo shot, as I just said. So this is, and these pictures are spectacular, so I thought I'd put at least once one um, of the first deliverable, that means sort of <coughs> drop it actually from an airplane, a uh, hydrogen bomb <coughs> that the Americans detonated March 1st, 1954. So this is sort of where my uh, story um, starts. So what brought the issue of fallout to international attention was the ill-fated journey of the Japanese fishing vessel Daigo Fukuyu Maru, or for me easier to say, Lucky Dragon uh, number five, in which a crew of 23 fishermen located with their fish about 85 miles from the explosion of the Castle Bravo shop got exposed to nuclear fallout. One of these fishermen died several months later. One of these survived, many of the survivors developed uh, cancer later in life. So my interest in this incident is its depiction in literature of the 1950s, when nuclear narratives became a literary genre. And if you sort of were interested in this, there's a lot of nuclear atomic literature out there in the 1950s. 
So what I want today in my talk is I will present you two examples from Germany, uh, or examples from Germany and the United States to show how writers sought uh, to put into words the paradigm shifting phenomenon of fallout. In the second half of my presentation, I will talk about the contemporary artist's depiction of Bikini Atoll today. One of these artists is from Switzerland, the other one from the Marshall Islands. So the trajectory I'm hoping to sketch out for you uh, begins with the realization that the fate of the Japanese fishermen on this boat here is something that could happen to all of us. So that's where the narrative of my story starts, could happen to all of us, and it develops into an understanding of a man-made environmental threat, namely radiation fallout, that affects local populations in specific ways. So what I'm getting at is sort of changing relations, conceptions of the local and the global. Um, time plays an important role here as well. While it of course can be expected that the way we think about a particular issue does change over time, radioactive uh, active contaminations that spread through fallout links us back, because it lingers for so long, so it links us back to the time when it was created, but it also radiates out into the future. The sum of that stuff is there for a very, very long time. So this is sort of my uh, outline and roadmap where I want to go with this. So the lucky dragon incident in the wake of the March 1st, 1954 Bravo shot is widely considered a turning point in the international response uh, to nuclear testing and the atomic bomb. Bravo, and a, and a, uh, an American writer and journalist, Daniel Lang's phrase, I quote, was the shot that made the world fall out conscious. It resulted in the words of literature scholar Hirofumi Utsumi in a massive reaction against nuclear weapons in Japan, but also worldwide. Australian researcher Stuart Firth, drawing attention to the hierarchies involved in international reporting, noted that the Japanese fishermen, not the Pacific Islanders, were the ones who made Bravo an international scandal. Even though well over 200 Marshallese um, and were also irradiated in the weather fallout as well as close to 30 US military personnel. The Japanese fishermen quickly became a symbol and symptom uh, for what might happen to all of us. A German cultural magazine in a brief article from March 27, 1954, so about a month after the shot, about a few weeks, put it this way. With the Japanese fishermen, mankind was injured. Nothing period less. So you can see, uh, I'm of course interested in language here, I mean this, this event had an effect on people and they were trying to come to terms with what this, this could mean. So German audiences, where I would start, lead, learned about the use and the testing of nuclear weapons with a degree of delay. A German translation of John Hersey's groundbreaking reporting on Hiroshima, you probably might have heard about this, sort of a long article first published in the New Yorker on August 31st, 1946, had a huge impact here in the US, came out in German translation in 1947, so about a year later, but it did not uh, receive widespread recognition in, uh, of course, what was at the time a very destroyed and war-torn uh, country. So the tests on Bikini, sort of nine years after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and in particular the Lucky Dragon event, um, marked the beginning of German literature's engagement with the nuclear bomb with some delay. So my first example that I want to talk about is the German writer Wolfgang Weihrauch, uh, 1904 to 1980, who counts among the well-known West German post-war writers, even if its work, this work itself has received somewhat scant uh, attention. His radio play, The Japanese Fisherman, um, here you can see the cover of the book, uh, the title obviously, The Alpamish and Fisher, The Japanese Fisherman, which is inspired by the story of the Lucky Dragon crew is part of the high school canon and garners at least name recognition uh, to this day. And this is my own copy. Um, you can see I was, when I bought this, I still had good handwriting. I was in eighth grade and I was, <laughs> <laughs> and I was kind of excited to go back to it and 
read it carefully, maybe for the first time. But anyway, it's sort of a bit of a classic, canonized text in uh, German uh, literature. So like many writers of the post-war period, so this is 1954, so this is, he wrote this very quickly, a couple of months after the Bravo shot uh, happened, he wrote this, so it's, it's obviously you can have it in, in, in printed form, but it's really a radio play, you can also listen to it, uh, they have it online, of course. So like many writers in the post-war period, Weyrock saw himself as a moral voice and a public uh, conscience. So in an essay, he talked quite a bit about the nuclear threat. In an essay about one of his anti-nuclear poems, Weibach asserts the socio-political role of the writer when he proclaims his goal of atomizing the atom by writing. So that's what he wanted to do, to atomize the atom by writing. So obviously this is a pretty self-confident statement also that you could do this, right? So now I will talk a little bit about the Japanese Fischer here. So Weibach's radio play, The Japanese Fisherman, raises three temporal levels. There's first the fishing trip and the exposure to fallout, then the fishermen's return to their village and their realization that they themselves and their catch that fish were contaminated, and then the village communities are resolved in its suicide. Weibach's fishermen are simple people, yet not naive. Searching for language, and it's, it's a lot about language. And what, what do we do with this? How do we describe this? So searching for language to describe the explosion they witnessed, they say, head, neck, and body of the explosion together look like a mushroom, using the newly emerging uh, terminology of the mushroom cloud. They also refer quite repeatedly to the green dragon, in a phrase that was ostensibly grounded in Japanese culture, probably more sort of German exoticizing of what happened there, but um, so the green dragon as a term for uh, the, the nuclear explosion comes up pretty uh, often. Utterances like the atom can jump, the rain was atom rain, make clear that the fishermen in this drama actually know what unfolds before them and where it comes from also the island where they always conduct their experiments, even if the US or the name Bikini are never mentioned. The fishermen trace their knowledge back to Nagasaki and the nuclear bomb drum dropped on the city back then, nine years ago. Perhaps we will have to crawl like the people of Nagasaki and we will look like lizards, one of them says. Walking towards the forest where they will kill themselves, the women in the group uh, recall miscarriages. My poor little child, it looked like a monkey. In the aftermath, and that of course also involves the aftermath of the Nagasaki bombings. Under the impression of the Bravo test, the experience of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings and the imagery associated with it gains attention it did not attract before. And just to be super clear, obviously we're talking about the German context. When this is sort of a German fantasy of what might have gone on in, in Japan here. So while Weibach includes accurate details, most likely gleaned from newspapers and illustrated magazines, which was reported extensively on the Lucky Dragon um, incident, and people have done research on so how did the German public find out about this, and um, that's how um, the play also not surprisingly, draw significantly, significantly on Western imagery, including Christian references like, yes, it was, referring to Nagasaki, like Judgment Day. It will again be like Judgment Day, which of course is owed to the German Christian context. The most significant deviation from the actual events is the villagers' joint suicide. This did not happen. Japan. The victims uh, have no one to hold accountable. All they can do is sacrifice themselves to protect others. So asking why those who got contaminated should kill themselves rather than the ones who threw the atom, voices of fishermen, fishermen's wives, fisher children, and again this is the radio play, conclude that those responsible will not do it, kill themselves. But somebody has to do it. Otherwise, people will get used to the atom and they will think that it's acceptable to throw the atom. The suicide of the fishing community is intended as a warning to the entire world. Addressing the audience, Fisherman Suzushi, the last to die, warns, be vigilant, you. So, talking to all of us. The 
Japanese fisherman confirms that the events of Hiroshima and Nagasaki entered the German public imagination more fully after the hydrogen bomb test of March 1st, 1954. Its suggestion of individual responsibility as a, as a solution to an international political problem is a product of the post-war West German culture. Here again, of course, the whole background here is the Nazi culture and German responsibility for that. And I think a little bit of that is sort of superimposed on this narrative as well. Entering into the world of the White Dragon crew, even if from a very German perspective, if you will, the Japanese fisherman invites its listeners to contemplate how the Japanese story might impact them and how they, as post-war Germans, might respond. Wolfgang Weibauch uh, was not the only uh, German uh, writer who, um, who, who reacted to the fate of the Japanese fishermen. Anna Segers, um, as a writer of Jewish descent who survived the Nazi period in exile in Mexico uh, and after World War II uh, resettled in the GDR in East Germany. And you can see interesting differences here. In the piece also written in 1954, responds to the uh, newspaper coverage about the incident and specifically to the Japanese fisherman who was hospitalized with severe burns and a radiation sickness. Titled um, the Japanese uh, fisherman, and I just show you, you can also see how easy German is, right? The Japanese fisherman. The Japanese fisherman. It's, it's no problem at all. Um, anyway, I just don't want to show sort of you this, this, this page here. So this is her uh, response to that story um, in 1954. Uh, so it begins with the assumption, Zegas, writing from a socialist perspective, that she does not know anything about her subject. Fisherman, but then goes on to realize that she gets into her essay that the person's nationality, Japanese, and, and occupation, fisherman, amount to important uh, information. Her rendition of the explosion invokes apocalyptic imagery when the sky glowed in hellish colors, only to reject the religious imagery right away, invoking instead the same terrestrial devil who was responsible for Hiroshima as well. And unlike Weilau, the West German Segers, now in East Germany, uh, names those responsible. The hydrogen bomb Americans who let the islands disappear. So that's a bit more concrete. Even if she does not name Bikini, Segers here does refer to the test site itself and the consequences to its geography. Emphasizing its global significance, Segers concludes that the hydrogen bomb floats in our shared sky. So to contemporary audience, the fate of the Japanese fishermen provides the key to understanding the new global reality of the nuclear age and the ubiquitous presence of what yet another German writer has described as the new death. So the Lucky Dragon incident clearly resonated with German writers and readers and listeners who began to associate the nuclear bomb and importantly, the fallout it spreads with the beginning of a new era in which the world is united under a great threat. So I will now turn to two US-American responses. And while, uh, of course, I would not and could not uh, claim that these are representative of their national cultures, because maybe my sample size is a bit too small for that, they do show some interesting um, differences. So I begin with Ralph uh, Lapp's um, nonfiction account, The Voyage of the Lucky Dragon. So uh, Lapp was a physicist and writer who was heavily involved in the US uh, nuclear program. He was a researcher at the University of Chicago. He worked on the Manhattan Project from 1942 to 46, and that's Americans developed the nuclear bomb. In 1946, he witnessed uh, the first tests on Bikini Atoll, because that's when they started testing there in his role as a nuclear consultant. And in 1954, he wrote The Lucky Dragon, under the impression of this incident, he traveled to Japan uh, and interviewed the fishermen, the real people, contaminated by the fallout, and then wrote The Voyage of the Lucky Dragon in response to what he learned there. He too felt that what happened to the fishermen on the Lucky Dragon ushered in a new 
Vera. An often quoted line from the very end of his book uh, reads, the true striking power of the atom was revealed on the decks of the Lucky Dragon. When men a hundred miles from an explosion can be killed by the silent touch of the bomb, the world suddenly becomes too small a sphere for men to clutch the atom. So this is sort of his conclusion at the end of this narrative. So for Lab, whose thinking on the nuclear test was shaped by the Cold War, and who remained a strong proponent of nuclear energy, certainly throughout his life, the issue is not only the global reach of fallout, but also, and perhaps more importantly, the role of science in creating and then understanding the consequences of a nuclear explosion. So the Voyage of the Lucky Dragon is a work of nonfiction, yet it uses many elements of fiction writing as it follows the story of the fisherman. The fishermen, for instance, are introduced as a good-humored seaman or muscular and intelligent, and the books describes uh, the fishing process in great uh, detail. The boats trip to the spot about um, 85 miles northeast of um, Bikini Atoll, where it was exposed to fallout, is told as a series of coincidences that gets them there. So there are technical problems, there are rough seas, there's a change in route, all of a sudden poor catch, all of these things um, underscore the randomness uh, that led to the ship's presence at this particular place and fateful time. The historian uh, of science, David K. Hecht, has shown in an insightful essay that early science writing on radioactive contamination frequently uses elements of the detective story for its messaging. I quote, mystery, secrecy, and uncertainty were defining elements of Cold War encounters with nuclear energy. In this case here in Lab's book, the reader knows the outcome. The book is 157, so the, the, the incident has been well publicized. The fishermen were contaminated by nuclear fallout. Uh, so we know this from the very beginning and sort of uh, uh, reversing the order. What we do as readers is we follow along as the narrative uncovers um, a secret, which we are already privy to. So one of Lab's main protagonists is radio man Aikichi Kuboyama, whom he characterizes as the smartest among the crew. So Lab's Kuboyama, and Kuboyama was a real person, obviously, I just want to be very clear, and he did die about six months after having been exposed to the fallout. So Lab's rendition uh, version of Kubuyama is the one who makes the connection to Hiroshima. When two of his, Kubuyama's fellow fishermen, lose their hair, Kubuyama recalls an aunt who lost hers in Hiroshima and as a result, I quote, firmly recognized the possibility of a connection between the crew's sickness and the ash which had fallen on March 1st. So there's Kubuyama who sort of figures it out slowly but surely and inevitably there's a second line of reporting in this, uh, uh, in this second storyline in the, in, in the narrative, that's the Japanese newspapers. Uh, and this uh, involves a young, enterprising, overly fond of sake, so nobody shies away from stereotype in here. Uh, um, so this, this young, this, this young uh, uh, newspaper reporter sort of figures out that there's a connection because he sees he sees uh, uh, an article or a short statement actually released by the Atomic Energy Commission in one of the Japanese newspapers according to which and I quote and this is real um, this was released during the course of a routine atomic test in the Marshall Islands 28 United States personnel and 236 residents were unexpectedly exposed to some radiation all are reported well so this is, this is a real quote that is in this book, and then the, 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 the reporter, and it's also certainly based on a real person, reads this, and he makes the connection to the Lucky Dragon uh, crew. So that's the second uh, plot line, and the third plot line involves Japanese doctors and scientists, including Dr. Kimura, an implacable man with a ramrod stiff back, who painstakingly and inevitably identify the chemical elements present uh, in the contaminated ash that the fishermen brought with them, and thus they uncover, uh, not just that the Americans exploded a nuclear bomb, but they exploded a hydrogen bomb. So, um, 
So while the analysis takes place on different levels, there's a common sense and awareness, in the case of Fukuyama, communication and competition, for the newspapers and science, for the doctors and chemists, neither of the actors is in doubt for a long time over what happened here. As in any detective story, of course, you need a culprit who tries to obscure the great tra traces of wrongdoing. In this case, it's the Atomic Energy uh, Commission, the AEC, trying to hide evidence uh, of which its members should have known that it cannot be suppressed, as well as several high-ranking politicians who fanned the international crisis that resulted from the incident by not acknowledging the U.S. Army's mistake of going through with the test despite unfavorable weather reports. For lab, the dictates of atomic secrecy are at the core of the problem, not uh, the atomic testing as such. Most importantly, the premise that uh, atomic explosions can be kept secret is a false one. Fallout will spread and fallout can be studied. Referring to the fact that the fishermen had been caught in a hydrogen bomb explosion, lab notes, it was inevitable that Japanese scientists would discover the truth once they had started analyzing the ashes. So while radiation is imperceptible to the human senses, it is anything but invisible to scientific analysis. As for the fishermen, they could have been saved had the Americans admitted their mistake right away and instructed them on, de uh, on our proper decontamination protocols. So Lamp's uh, narrative is noticeably different from the German examples in narrative structure, use of language, and the conclusions he draws. While the German writers invoke religion and mythology to comprehend the reality of nuclear fall fallout, and this includes even the communist writer Anna Segas, Lab uh, points to science as the key uh, to understanding. Where the German writers approach fallout as a new reality that invades, uh, evades comprehension, Lab suggests that there's nothing incomprehensible about it, only the actions of those who seek to hide it. Yet for him too, the hydrogen bomb ushers in a new era when he concludes that the Earth is too small for, as I quoted before, men to clutch the atom. So he's not totally clear in the conclusions he really wants to draw here. For the German writers who learned about the Japanese fishermen through newspapers and magazines, their fate triggers reflections about what it means for the whole world, by which of course they also mean Germany, which was just recovering from a devastating war. Lab, by contrast, pays much closer attention to the fishermen themselves and depicts them not merely as victims, but also as the people whose inadvertent exposure led to the discovery of a secret that never should have been a secret. As an American, Lab felt in a position to name the culprit, naming the AC, the Atomic Energy Commission, German writers who um, all uh, viewed themselves as potential victims, for the most part, shied away from that, especially in West Germany. So the fate of Aikichi Kubuyama, um, as I said, was a real person, the Lucky Dragon's radio man who died about half a year after having exposed, uh, also drew the attention of uh, Lithuanian-born American artist Ben Shan, who together with the writer Richard Hudson published a book, a picture book titled Kubuyama and the Saga of the Lucky uh, Dragon. So this is from 1965. So you can see in the US here too, this, this topic resonated with, with people. So based on Ralph Lapp's account, the book describes Kubuyama as the first victim of the hydrogen, of the H-bomb age of nuclear weapons. Unlike Lapp, Shah held left-leaning political views and was a vocal opponent of nuclear testing. The focus uh, on Kubuyama as an ordinary man became a victim, personalizes the story, and at the same time gives it a universal quality. In 50 pages of text, so much and images are much shorter than, than, than Lab's 300-page book, the book reduces Lab's narrative to the story of Kubuyama and arrives at a different conclusion. In the final page, it re reviews the chain of coincidences that brought the Lucky Dragon crew, crew close to Bikini to underscore that anyone can <coughs> Uh, in a series of rhetorical questions that culminates in the query whether humans can live together on this planet without engaging in mass murder, the book attributes historical importance to Kubuyama as either the first of many millions of victims of the thermonuclear age or as the last victim. 
Shams images, I would say. So this is here the, 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 the title page. These are some other images from the book. Um, have sort of a, maybe I would say it's Japanese quality here. The one on the, on the right uh, shows the, 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 the newspaper that gave the people the attention of the nation focused on the 23 uh, hospitalized fishermen. So responding to the news, so you can see this in some sort of Japanese. Uh, dress, but at the same time, I think there's also this, this universal uh, quality. And here, the frontispiece, which also is included in the body of the book, shows a serious man uh, with bright eyes looking straight ahead, prominent eyebrows and creases in his forehead. I think his dark color <coughs> that gets referred to in the, in the narrative reflects the burns he received, as does the missing hair. Yet, I think the image also projects dignity and strength in the face of death. So this is not just sort of a victim, but also somebody who faces his, his fate uh, with dignity. So as different as these narratives are, they share the concern over phenomenons, newness and whose global reach they all try to come to terms with. Cultural frameworks across and within international contexts play a significant role here, one of which, of course, is the Cold War divide, sort of how you saw yourself here in this emerging conflict, which of course also uh, drove the, the, the development and testing of nuclear weapons. In their ordinariness and because of the randomness of the exposure, the Japanese fishermen inspired the international imagination and drew attention to fallout as a global consequence of nuclear tests that could no longer be dismissed as happening on a far away island in the Pacific Ocean. So I will now jump ahead into the contemporary period and talk about two artists who offer a present day uh, perspective on Bikini Atoll and the legacies of the nuclear testing. And these artists are Julian Charrière and Kathy Jetniel Kitchener. Neither of them focuses on the Lucky Dragon uh, incident, but I should say here that many more fishermen were exposed than the, three, the 23 uh, crew me members of the Lucky, Lucky Dragon. And um, this topic was just explored in two recent uh, Japanese uh, documentaries, so the people following up the, the survivors, widows, children, etc., of other people exposed. So the story certainly continues when we're done with the Japanese fishermen. So Julian Charrier comes to Bikini Atoll as an outsider. Born in Morges, uh, Switzerland in 1987, he completed a degree at the University of the Arts in Berlin in 2013. He currently, from what I know, lives in Berlin, and um, his work uh, evolves around his ability and his willingness to travel to remote places that epitomize in stark terms the human impact on the environment. The effort he exerts to reach these sites, and in many cases the physical challenges involved in creating the works of art are integral to Charlier's projects. He's a really interesting uh, artist, so I would recommend him to do stuff, his finest stuff on the uh, internet to look into this some more. So in October and November of 2016, Julian Charlier and his collaborator, the art historian and curator Nadine Saman, undertook a trip to Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands for the purpose of experiencing and representing through art the relics of the nuclear tests which had been conducted there 70 years prior, detailing what remains on this site, both above and below the waterline. It's one of the things the Americans did, they put a lot of ships, battleships, into the Bikini Lagoon and try to figure out do these things, these thing, uh, things sink when you throw a nuclear bomb on them or not. So, and then some of these wrecks are still in the lagoon and they dove down there, so it's a pretty fascinating story. So for his uh, Bikini Atoll project, Charrier received an important Berlin art prize that honors Berlin-based artists whose work is situated at the interface of art and science. Shown in a Berlin art museum, the link between Bikini and Berlin becomes visible in the exhibition site. So Charrier's Bikini Atoll project, as presented in the Berlin Gallery, comprises three rooms of increasing size with photographs, video installations, and mixed media constructions. The first smallest room uh, holds a large uh, format color photograph of a tropical sunset taken on bikini 
from Chalier series First Light, on which I will uh, focus here. So the leaflet that uh, guides the visitor through the exhibition <coughs> describes Teva, First Light, and that's what you would have seen as the first, it's very large scale in the uh, original in this exhibition. Uh, so I quote from the uh, leaflet for the visitor, is a large format color photograph double exposure caused by radiation. So these blotches is what we're referring to here. So like other uh, images in this series, and there are over 20 images, Teva, it employs generic visual tropes associated with the idea of a tropical paradise. You can see this pretty clearly, right? Beach, ocean, sky, palm fronts. Like other test names, Romeo, Cedar, Yucca, Nutmeg, Sycamore, Abel, Coon, etc. Teva, which is a language spoken by a group of Native Americans in New Mexico, is a code name for atomic tests conducted on Bikini and Inuita. And you can, and Inuita is this another island in the Marshall Islands where they conduct that even more tests than on Bikini. So obviously you can analyze why these innocuous sounding names here. So to recall the test conducted on Bikini Atoll, Charrier has created over 20 such images, and I have another one here, as if there are many of those, but you can sort of see the principle a little bit here. Um, each of which is scattered with white blotches in irregular patterns, in some cases resembling clouds or fog, uh, behind which the original scene can still be discerned. In others, um, the blotches are so intense that they seem to have burned a hole in the photograph. To achieve this effect, Charlier placed radioactive sand collected on bikini, and he describes this, onto the exposed uh, but undeveloped film, and that's a process that involves French physicist Henri Becquerel's um, 1896 experiment in which he, Becquerel, discovered that uranium salts will leave an image on undeveloped uh, photographic plates without the influence of sunlight. So there's a close connection between photography for the photographic paper and uh, radioactivity and to the time uh, since I'm part of my larger projects, I mean the examples from Chernobyl, from Fukushima, where people do somewhat similar things, sort of these double exposures to make it visible. Um, so I think sort of Chevalier's double exposures bring things full circle. Photographic plates first made radioactivity detectable, and here radioactively altered conventional photographic subjects allow us to see the otherwise invisible consequences of human nuclear activity. With this achievement, Charlier and Saman, his, his collaborator, write with reference to the nuclear tests, night fell on a period of human history and a new day was born. With its random specks of light scattered across the photographs, the series first light is an attempt at imagining uh, this uh, new day through artistic means. Bikini Atoll turned out to be a challenging work environment. Shagia and his collaborator had to probe the ground at several locations and needed to dig a deeper than expected hole before their Geiger counter indicated that they had reached the aggressive particulate ore of the atomic age. So together, the photographs and the accompanying narrative from which I just quoted take existing and intentionally conventional imagery and develop it further to represent nuclear realities. The result of human physical and artistic labor, Charlier's photographs not only make visible what is otherwise invisible, they also draw attention to the place where the tests were conducted um, and challenge the prevailing Western imagination of islands Cherrier, too, insists on the paradigm-shifting, changing quality, uh, paradigm-changing quality of the events at Bikini. Unlike his predecessors, he engages with Bikini as a physical site, bringing his uh, images into the exhibition space in Berlin, where I have the privilege of seeing this. He creates a connection between Bikini and the German capital and suggests that the events from 70 years ago still very much concern us today and into the future. I will now turn to my final example, um, the works of um, Kathy Jadriel Kitchener, and I hope I'm not the only one in this room who's worked on her. Um, so she was born in 1989 in the Marshall Islands. Uh, she's the daughter of uh, the Marshall Islands' first female president, Hilda Heine, who was president from 2016 to 2020. 
uh, Kathy Jekyll Kitchener was uh, raised in Hawaii and uh, earned a degree in Pacific Island Studies from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She currently teaches Pacific Studies at the College of the Marshall Islands. She's an activist, poet, and performance artist, and you can find her work on the internet in, in, in videos, and it's really quite impressive and stunning. I would really urge you to take a um, look here. Like most authors from the Pacific Islands, as I, I learned, Jekyll Kitchener writes in English, but her poems also include Marshallese words and phrases as well. So this is the, um, the, 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 the cover of the book from which I will discuss one poem. And you can see here, she has an explanation of Yep Yaltok. It's, it's a basket, you can perhaps read it from here, from the Marshallese English Dictionary. And she does this quite a bit, and she really brings in the Marshallese uh, language as well. So what I want to do is here, in closing, I will focus on, on Jenny Kitchener's poem History Project, which is included in this uh, collection. So the poem, which is part of a cycle of the same title, recalls a school project, um, I quote from the poem, on nuclear testing on the Marshall Islands. Spread out over four printed pages, the prose poem uses quotations from a variety of sources, marking them as such with italics and capitalizations, uh, and has no punctuation until a period at the very end. Um, the first person narrator, who you probably identified with the author, decides at 15, that it is time to learn my own history. The poem then rehearses a history with which the narrator is already familiar. I already knew all of this, she says, suggesting that this lesson is, uh, um, is for a reader unfamiliar with the history of the Marshall Islands. The poem recalls um, names like Operation Bravo, these were the first tests in 19. Uh, 46 on Bikini Atoll, Henry Kissinger's infamous pronouncement, 90,000 people are out there, who gives a damn? And the well-known photographs of young children uh, with burn marks on their skin, and this is, if you research this, you can find this very easily. Um, this is a child victim from the uh, Marshall Islands, from these uh, Castle Bravo exposure. So, so you have the young children with burn marks on their skin, and she refers to all of this in the poem after having exposed the infamous jelly babies, tiny beings with no bones. It then goes on to reference my um, uh, uh, islander ancestors cross-legged before a general listening to his fairy tale about how it's for the good of mankind to hand over our islands. And these are very famous, if you sort of research, these are really famous images. This is not a secret, uh, uh, great uh, discovery. It's, it's, it's been circulated widely, and then she refers to this. So the, the poem here refers to Commodore Ben Wyatt, that's the guy sitting here lecturing the locals, asking the Bikinians to leave their island in a scene captured on films or on newsreels. These references to authentic visual images, which are easily available through books and websites, ground the poem in an external reality. They also suggest that the history of the nuclear test on Bikini and elsewhere in the Marshall Islands is accessible to anyone who seeks this knowledge. With us, it's the literature person with its use of a verbal as well as visual quotations. The poem shares aspects of uh, docu poetry, which I guess is sort of the new um, genre that people have uh, established. Yet the poem also includes a revenge fantasy as the speaker learns that Americans express more sympathy for animals used for testing purposes than for the Marshallese people wishing to, I quote, send ripples of death to a people who put goats before human beings. And here I have um, the, it's, it's a relatively long poem, so this is, just the, this left something out, this is sort of the last page of the poem here. So being only 15, but I'm only 15, so she gets, at first she's kind of calm and collected, I knew all, all of these, then she gets angry after all, because one does get angry when looking at this, even if it's well known, and then, she said, but I'm only 15, sort of going back to her alter ego in, in high school. Um, the narrative is her only option is to finish her project on the poster board. I bought the office max. I spray painted in bold stencil uh, yellow for the good of mankind. This is sort of a phrase that comes up time and again if it quotes uh, uh, Commodore Wyatt. And then the three balding judges fail to understand the irony 
uh, of the use of this often quoted phrase and quote forms finalized is and I'm lost. So I think what is at stake in this poem is the recovery and retelling of history, but also very much so the question of audience. Unlike her 50-year-old narrator, Jenny Kitchener addresses her poems to an international audience and not just the three uh, white uh, judges. Um, so going beyond recording the nuclear tests on the Eden Atoll, uh, history projects reflects on communication and audience in, in, as important factors in the circulation of this story. Finally, the poet uh, also speaks about, uh, poem by, uh, addresses my island ancestors and the Marshallese as a nation, avoiding altogether uh, the word bikini and its ambiguous connotations. With its autobiographical quality and its connotations to uh, its connections to authentic reality, the poem challenges the idea of a distanced observer. That's a quote from Joseph Masco, the anthropologist I mentioned first, but um, who's untouched by the consequences of the nuclear tests. Um, I think it also challenges the idea that we're all touched uh, by this in the same way. Um, in doing so, Jethro Kitchener asserts that the right to uh, asserts the right to a future for the Marshall Islands. So not just looking back, but also what does this mean going forward. So in conclusion, the writers and artists whose work on nuclear fallout I've presented here engage in acts of resistance to political decisions as well as colonial relationships. With the growing international awareness of fallout as a substance that moves in unpredictable ways and whose consequences over time are momentous yet also very hard to gauge, nuclear weapons, which in the aftermath of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were described as exceptionally powerful bombs with local effects, become a global concern. The trajectory from the German responses to the Japanese fishermen, who are all potential victims, to the engagement with the Marshall Islands and the voices of artists like Julian Charrier and Kathy Jenkins Kitchener remakes the understanding of the global through attention to local conditions. I think my examples also show that our responses to environmental threats are dynamic. They change over time, and I think that's actually quite important even in our current situation to think about and maybe step back for a, a moment. New voices emerge, existing sites are being revisited and reimagined. As the story of fallout becomes more complex and more differentiated, perhaps, would be my hope, we can also speak out against it more effectively. Thank you.